Welcome to Grapple Arts Radio. Hello, everybody. This is Stefan Kesting from GrappleArts.com. Today I'm having a chat with Jeff Westfall. Jeff runs the Rising Phoenix Martial Arts Academy in Evansville, Indiana, but that's not how I got in touch with him or found out about him. I found out about him through his podcast called The Martial Brain, which really is this interesting intersection of critical thinking, skepticism, neuroscience, and martial arts, right? The martial brain, it makes sense. And, uh, you know, I've, I've listened to a few of your podcasts, Jeff, and I really like your approach of sort of a, a skeptic's point of view to martial arts. So I'm guessing you're not spending most of your time prancing around doing kata and uh, <laughs> <laughs> practicing your five-finger palm exploding heart technique. Your guess would be correct, Stefan. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I've always... You know, early on in, in my martial arts career, <clears throat> I'm, I'm pretty old. I started training in 1971. And early on, I was always kind of leery of what I saw, you know, some of the crazy stuff, the chi power and demonstrations. I was fooled by a few of them because I was so young. But very quickly and early on, I started seeing, um, hmm, this, this doesn't seem to pass the smell test. And mm-hmm. uh, that kind of stuck with me all through time. And then, of course, when I became interested in, in Bruce Lee's approach, that struck me as a very skeptical approach to martial arts as well. And, I, of course, I admired him. I was a young man. Mm-hmm. Well, I think nowadays, when you, when you think back to what Bruce Lee's central premise was, which was, or some of his central premises, you know, take from different martial arts. If you're doing Shotokan, you just don't need to do Shotokan. You, it's okay to take some judo. It's okay to take some Japanese jiu-jitsu. It's okay to do some gas boxing. <laughs> and, then, and then go field test it, like actually go do sparring. I don't think right. he did that much grappling sparring, but I do know he did a, quite a bit of, of stand-up kickboxing sparring. And now when you tell people about that, they're like, well, duh, of, of course you should do that. <laughs> but it, it, uh, it's like that stage of knowledge where first everybody denies it, then everybody attacks you, and then everybody uh, accepts it as so so obvious that it should be self-evident, but it wasn't self-evident. For it sure wasn't, no. Like, like I said, in the early 70s, um, like I, I was, uh, by the time I was teaching, I started teaching in 1975, and I was so into Bruce Lee's approach that even though my background was in Kyoku Shin and in uh, a, a kung fu style called Tai Lung Kung Fu, um, you know, most schools, most commercial schools, they didn't allow you to kick below the waist when you sparred. And I very carefully, keeping safety uh, as a factor, I very, I very uh, carefully asked my students, go ahead, when we spar, let's practice kicking low. And we were just considered the Cobra Kai Academy of the area where I am <laughs> because of that. You know, they're, they're crazy. They kick to the legs. And I'd say, well, isn't it crazy to kick at someone's head if you don't have good control? Mm-hmm. It, it's all these hidebound ideas about what is, what is okay and what is not. And that was just one example. Mm-hmm. Well, this is the point karate era where only a few maniacs like the Kyokushin guys, were going full contact. Right, right. And, and boxers. <laughs> right, right. And, and like you said, I loved when you said gasp, boxing. Like one of my, uh, one of my er- earliest karate instructors used to use this phrase when he was trying to describe a haymaker punch, but he would describe it as a, a wild, uncontrolled boxing-style hook. Oh, you know, really? As, yeah, as if boxing is this, you know, just sort of two dudes with no training whatsoever just kind of letting their gorilla out. You know, mm-hmm. not giving any credit at all to the science behind boxing. And I didn't, and I, I kind of took that in because I was so young, and then I met a few boxers and realized the error of my ways when they pummeled my head scientifically. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, I guess that instructor never actually put on the gloves and stepped into the ring. But I guess, you know, given that all his techniques, and I'm, I'm guessing wildly here, were, you know, crane strikes, using uh, to, to the meridian points, it was right. much too deadly to do in the boxing ring, and you can't right. do it with those big gloves. Yep. So. Yeah, that's the excuse I've heard a lot through the years. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I mentioned that in one of my podcasts about a guy who once claimed that you know, his students couldn't even spar because the techniques they practiced were far too deadly for sparring. Since we came up in the same era of uh, Black Belt Magazine, do you remember the Dim Mock guy? There were all these photos of him breaking coconuts and breaking boards who claimed that he had developed so much poisonous chi in his left hand that he couldn't hold a baby in his left hand because it would kill the baby. 
I, I don't remember. I, I might remember his name if I heard him, but I don't remember that particular claim. <laughs> that's that's, but, that's isn't fantastic. That fantastic? <laughs> <laughs> I remember I'm, Ed Saturnowski. You remember him? Oh, yeah, yeah. Let people kick him in the crotch full power. Mm-hmm. I, I think Penn and Teller should do an episode on him because I'm. That would be wonderful. I, mean, I, I I still wonder what the trick was. I mean, maybe it was just total pain desensitization. Yeah, I'm I'm not sure. Um, obviously, I, I would be skeptical that it was any kind of uh, any kind of chi power, of course. Mm-hmm. But uh, you know, there had to be something that was going on there that can't be that good for you. Yeah. It, uh, well, I mean, I wonder. It's uh, the idea of chi, the idea of this internal energy that's flowing and passing through you and doing all these miraculous things. I, I wonder sometimes if you could sort of rehabilitate the idea and say what you're actually doing when you're activating your chi is entering into a state of flow as defined by Csikszentmihalyi, the, uh, the guy who wrote that book called Flow. You know, it's, it's a little bit different from saying I'm going to send my chi across the room and, and defeat you at 20 feet and, right. and send you to the floor or, or hit you on the chest and have your heart explode or kill right. a baby. But, you know, maybe, maybe originally that was what the metaphor was. Or maybe it's just the traditional martial arts been stringing people along for thousands of years because one way or another they wanted a little bunch of robots to go forth and do their bidding. And well, I, I talk about that a little bit in uh, one of the episodes of my podcast is called Stand Up Straight and Breathe, Grasshopper. And I talk about how, you know, so many folks say that the reason you have to have good posture is to make your chi flow correctly. And the reason you have to breathe well is to make your chi flow correctly. And originally, that's the original translation, if I'm, if, 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 uh, I'm correct, that in Chinese, the chi literally translates as breath. So it stands to reason, I think, I kind of have a hypothesis that, People saw that, you know, when you kept someone from breathing from long enough, you die. Mm-hmm. That's, that's powerful, you know, uh, that's powerful evidence right there in front of you that some power was, was taken out of this guy's body when he was not able to breathe anymore. Mm-hmm. And I, I just wonder if that was like, oh, the, the life force has gone out of his body and it's connected intimately to breathing. Of course, they didn't know anything about th- that the atmosphere is 20 some odd percent oxygen. Mm-hmm metabolism of oxygen in the body it just seemed like a, a magical force has gone had gone out of them mm-hmm. so I, I wonder about that and and like you said it's so many it means so many different things to so many different people and it can be expressed so many different ways it's pretty hard to nail down sometimes well let's let's forget about chi for a second I mean, both you and i have trained in kung fu i did years of hunger kung fu some uh southern crane some northern shaolin and i took it pretty seriously I mean, there was always some skepticism there, like, am I, am I, is what I'm learning really going to work? But I think it's pretty, a pretty representative cross-section of the Chinese martial arts system, some southern systems, some northern systems, you know, some systems with deep horse dances, lots of forms, few forms, uh, by forms, you know, katas, repeated right. movement patterns. So we'll say most Chinese martial arts systems, and we'll, we'll just rag on the Chinese for a little bit, involve many, many, many forms or patterns where you're doing it, you're hopping around, stroking your imaginary beard, mounting your imaginary horse, and defeating opponents in every direction. So how on earth did this become the dominant martial arts training paradigm of what seems like an entire country, all of China? Yeah, I mean, there were some Chinese systems that did things like sticking hands, which is starting to move towards some kind of semi-competitive thing, but it's still pretty heavily constrained. And those were in the minority, seemingly. I mean, was all this stuff super combat tested once upon a time and then just ossified into, you know, uh, forms for ease of teaching and ease of not actually having to get out there and scrap with your students? Like, what do you think? What's your theory? I, isn't it fascinating just to, to think about these things? Like, I wish I could go back in time and see what was going on. How often were people actually sparring or not? Um, I, I suspect that part of the reason for that is a little bit like uh, keeping military secrets secret. They didn't want to write things down, so they would compose these sequences that acted as a dictionary, uh, as a s- syllabary for, their te- for the, the technical elements of their style, and could pass it on to someone else and then that person, it wasn't written down. You had to ask, get the guy to teach you for it to be passed along to you. I may be completely off base with this, but it strikes me as one logical 
answer to things like that. It doesn't, it doesn't address the problem of how do we know whether this works or not. Mm -hmm. um, but I do suspect that because watching someone do a form well is so impressive that it was an easy way to sell to people that, hey, look at this, boom, 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 you know, I can do this. Don't you want to be able to do that? And I think that might have been a really good way to sell things to people. And, and then you could probably the t – something that's going on for, forever in martial arts is, is what I call the teacher's trick, which is, of course, it's very easy to demonstrate something on someone when they're cooperating with you. And uh, chances are by the time a student has drunk the Kool-Aid and is, is with you and training with you, you say, here, throw a punch at me. You know how that is. Well, now I know mm -hmm. the timing of the punch. I know, I know when, and when and where it's coming. So you know, it's very easy to convince people that, that you've got something special that they want to learn without necessarily having them spar. And I, I think once you've got them under your influence, sort of the cultish behavior of many martial arts styles would, would d then kick in, and you just do whatever the master tells you. If, if he's, mm -hmm. You're not going to say, you know, why don't we spar? Maybe you might be exiled if you, <laughs> if you ask that question. I don't, I, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fascinating question, and I agree with you. You have to wonder how this entire culture grew up and became so prevalent. Well, I wonder maybe, maybe I mean, Danny Nosanto, who both of us, as it turns out, are associated with, has said that a martial arts is three things. It's the techniques, it's the equipment, and it's the training method. I yeah. mean, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu would look very different if we were doing it on pavement all the time. Uh, <laughs> yes, it would. It would also look very different if the training method were different. You know, if the training method, the sparring and the sort of competitive drilling is such a large part of it. You took that out of it, and I bet you within two or three generations, you and I are you know, we're teaching it to our students, they're teaching it to their students, they're teaching it to their students. They're going to be, okay, today we're going to do techniques 657 through you know, 701, right. and we're going to do flow sequence one. And it's essentially going to end up looking a lot like a kata. I agree. In a couple generations. I, th I think within a few generations, that's how the phrase ancient wisdom comes to, comes to kick in. You know, it's there, without someone constantly applying the paradigm of the scientific method of, of questioning things, it just becomes, like you said, ossified and, and becomes respected the same way people nod their heads when you say, oh, yes. Yes, that's that's ancient wisdom, and and it seems they have a reverence for something like that. Yeah, I mean, you can make an argument for it. Like supposing you're dealing with samurai swords, where you know if you and I are sparring with real samurai swords, <laughs> and we <laughs> screw up, or even if we don't screw up, it's going to be a short sparring match. Yep. Because you're going to cut off my arm, or I'm going to cut off your head, or we're both going to stab each other, and we're both going to die. And you could make an argument saying that, okay, we'll, we'll do it sportively. We'll put on, you know, kendo gear and we'll whack each other. But then we're going to train habits that apply to sport and not to real life. And then that's where Jigoro Kano essentially took traditional Japanese jiu-jitsu and threw out all the stuff that couldn't be trained competitively or couldn't be sparred. So I wonder if, you know, a high-level kendo master, you know, or kendo competitor, how that would look against the real samurai, or alternately, an Olympic-level fencer dueling in 17th century England with the rapier, would the Olympic training, would the reflexes and the um, athletic skills developed in a, that very heavily constrained environment translate through to real combat with a real rapier? It's, it's interesting, and I think the only way you could really test that is would be to get a large enough sample size, because of course with just and that was one of the fallacies of the original UFC was the right. sample size was very small. Of course, you're not going to take anybody and have them fight a thousand times. Right. Um, that's the, the internal problem of, of what we're discussing. But so, so you're saying maybe Hoist Gracie won just because of who Hoist Gracie is and not because of the superiority of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I, 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 I don't know if I would go that far. I would say it wasn't a large enough sample size to determine it either way. I personally right. feel that it probably was because of, of the ju Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I think sure. it's great stuff. But that's 2020 hindsight. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and I remember and, hearing about a, a match between a, what was it, a, an English sailor or a Portuguese sailor and a Japanese samurai. So it was Epe against Samurai Sword. And the uh, sailor managed to skewer the samurai and won. And That's thus, interesting. 
That's it. it probably wasn't an epee. It was probably more of a rapier. Oh, sorry. I'm thinking the sport. Yes, I'll go right. with I'll go with rapier. Um, but that doesn't really prove anything. I mean, it, no. it it's one it, data uh, point. Yeah, you'd have to have them fight a hundred times, or have to fight. Yeah. You know, clash the two cultures together. I mean, it, I don't know if you listened to my. Uh, I think it was the second of my podcast where I talked about martial sport versus martial combat arts. Discussing exactly no, I've only it. I've listened to the later episodes, not the not the very earlier ones, Jeff. Okay, yeah, the the second one is exactly the subject we're talking about. I go into it, and to me, the real truth lies in a, a mix of the two. Because on the one hand, of course, by imposing rules and safety equipment, you create blind spots, you know, in the individual. Mm-hmm. It's, but but yet at the same time, if all you do is think about combat and practice for combat, but you don't ever spar it, then how do you ever fake right and then go left? You know how, mm-hmm. how do you ever create the athleticism necessary for that kind of competition? So to me, I think applying the athleticism, whether you're going to compete or not, just by having, as as Eric Paulson says, you've got to spar it. You know. Mm-hmm. Without, you know, but yet at the same time, you also have to factor in, okay, what if I have a guy in my guard and he pulls a dagger out? Well, that changes right. things entirely. It's a fascinating <laughs> mix, you know, the whole idea of, of you know, which, and that's why I talk about in that episode is the old cliche is which is better. And to me, a mix of the two is better. I remember coming back, coming to a jiu-jitsu class. I think I was a purple belt or something. And I mentioned that I had just been training with Danny Nasanto doing some C-Lot stuff. And the guy was like, oh, yeah, well, how would uh, C-Lot counter the triangle choke? It's like, oh, okay, <laughs> there's a counter. And so I put on my gi. But while I was putting on my gi, I took a karambit, which was a, a, a training knife. It's this weird hook knife with a hole for your index mm-hmm. finger. Almost yep. impossible to disarm. Really, it's a grappling knife when you think about it. And I slipped it inside my gi. <laughs> and then uh, I let the guy put me in a triangle choke. And I took it out, and I cut his femoral artery on one side, his femoral artery on the other, his brachial artery, his uh, carotid. I, I assume you mean you simulated cutting them. Yes. Yes. <laughs> no, because I, I, you know, he was challenging me, so you know, I had to, somebody had to die. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I simulated it, and it was just funny how it took a good ten seconds for the guy to realize what was going on, and that is, of course. Truly, what a you know, most the sea lots, well, a typical sea lot answer would be to uh, to a triangle choke. Sure, and it's, it, it's I think a military art. the culture situations are really interested. I mean, if 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 we wanted to test whether I don't know, ninjutsu is better than uh, a, a, a samurai uh, skills. And we let the guy out there, and he's got his blinding powder in one hand. He throws the blinding powder. Blind the samurai stabs him and the gut wins. That's going to work one time. Right. But as soon as word spreads on the Watch internet, out for the blinding powder. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Wear goggles. Um, <laughs> that trick is gone. And similarly, if you know the guy's going to try and pull a knife and you got him in your triangle choke, I'm not saying it's impossible to pull a knife, but it becomes a lot, lot harder. Yes. Um, so it's, it's these little tricks that work. And maybe that's the essence of this martial art versus martial sport thing. Martial sport trains the bread and butter again and again and again. It makes you really good at the jab, the cross, the hook, the knee, the, the arm bar, the whatever. But you get these little blind spots, like you said, where you know the blinding powder and the, the knife <laughs> and the, you know, your special trick is like, oh, no, here come the cops. And the guy looks around, and then you hit him. You know, that'll work once. And maybe on the street all you need is a per- it to work once, but if you can combine the, you know, your little trick with a solid right cross developed in sparring, that's that's much more I powerful agree. than just doing one or the other. My, my, I, I must admit that I'm a little more biased towards the sports side simply because I love sparring and I've sparred in so many different approaches to martial arts through the years. But that doesn't take away the fact that I I think about things like this. You know, I mean, I, mm-hmm. you have to think about them. But I think that once you've been in a martial sport for a long enough time. I think that that those blind spots tend to to become less of important. Like in one data point, of course, it's just one data point. The classic story of Ryan Hall getting attacked. I don't know if you, you remember that. If you've heard about this, when he was was that the YouTube, YouTube video and the yeah the, the, yeah exactly. Yeah, okay. it, was, it was really cool because because this guy was turned out he was like a mental patient. This guy was insulting him in a restaurant along with the other people. He came up and asked for a light, and they said, "We're sorry, none of us here smoke." And he goes, "Oh, so you think you're better than me?" And 
yeah. before long, this guy wanted to, wanted to fight. Well, Ryan Hall was really cool with him and finally convinced the guy to step outside so that, because the owner of the restaurant was really worried. And he, he took the guy down and, and got, got him mounted and just stayed gently there on top of him. Gently is the best word to describe it. Finally had to choke the guy out with a triangle. You know, but if he had only been a, a, a tournament player for six months, Maybe he would have got his clock clean, you know. But at the level he's at, I don't think it much matters whether he practices a sport or a combat art. Mm-hmm. And I also have to say that Ryan Hall seems to really concentrate on what would work in a real fight and not just in jiu-jitsu and all of his instructional videos. So i got to give him credit for that, too. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I'm not – I don't have a huge list of street fights to my name. I think most people who – like That's good for you. <laughs> got, yeah, exactly. Most people who got 10, 20 street fights – either are assholes or spend way too much time around drunk people or drunk right. themselves. Yeah, if you're, if you're going out said, testing the hypo, your hypotheses by fighting, then there's something definitely wrong with you. Yeah, and I mean, it's just the more martial arts I do, the more, the more worry I am about stuff like that because you see, you know, on any given day, anybody can beat anybody. A 12-year-old kid could take out Mike Tyson in his prime if he takes a pencil and jams it into his eye, like Absolutely. done. And you can put them in, together in the ring, and a thousand times out of a thousand, Mike Tyson will knock that kid out. Absolutely. But in real life, it might only be, uh, you know, 95 times out of 100. And, and, uh, and Bruce Lee could have slipped on a banana peel, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Any, anything can happen. <laughs> no, not, not St. Bruce. Not St. Bruce. <laughs> uh, it, uh, I was with you up until that point, but you're just, uh, <laughs> I, it's highly unlikely. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, maybe we can continue this conversation. Okay, good. I'm yeah. glad I salvaged that. <laughs> yeah, well, um, where were we before we got derailed by St. Bruce? Uh, the, yeah, right. But one thing that has kept me out of a lot of confrontations is just reminding myself that there are a lot of mentally ill people out there. You know, I, I yeah. don't know what the official statistic is. I've, had, I've heard one in ten people has mental health issues. And you know what? Whether that's true or not depends probably on some extent how you define mental illness. Is sure. depression mental illness? Is, right. You know, There's uh, so many spectra and so many places on the spectra. Yeah. Um, but keep, if you use that as a, um, just as a reminder, then maybe that guy out there who's coming up to you in the middle of the street, pushing you on the chest and suggesting that you do, uh, you know, perform uh, sexual activities on him in public, which has happened to me. Wow. Um, yeah. I mean, I, part of me wanted to drift him, and it, it could have ended very quickly. But then it was like, okay, who goes around demanding this in public? Really, right. it's people who are out of their minds, right? Like, so Yahoo, I've beat up somebody who's been off their lithium for a couple of days. Right, right. Aren't I a big stud? So keeping this in mind and also having the experience in the martial arts where you're in the, you're essentially putting yourself into confrontation situations all the time. It's no longer this, you don't get this huge fight or flight reflex, or if you do, it's <laughs> probably for a good reason. You probably really are being chased by four people with machetes. At which right. point, go ahead, have your fight or flight. It's, it's, that's, that's what it's there for. Your fight or flight is not when there's some homeless dude who's, you know, muttering inappropriate things underneath his breath. That's not the time that you need to, you know, beat some guy up to prove your manhood. And that, that's a very rational way to look at it. But one of the things I, I like to emphasize over and over again in, in the Marshall Brain podcast is how – Part of our brains are rational as humans, although a lot of us don't ever show that, and a lot of us never engage that part of our brain. There's still that there's still that barely evolved chimpanzee inside every one of us that, if we're not really careful, responds to that that challenge. The guy wanting to be in your face, we drop the civilization if we're not really careful, and immediately mm-hmm. give in to the, we let the chimpanzee take the controls, as I say. Yeah, and, I use and, the same analogy. I just say caveman brain, but I think we're meaning yeah. the exact same. Right. Better. It's so easy for that to happen to any. The, the, doesn't matter how rational you are in your everyday life. When it's a physical confrontation, if you're not very careful, you let the wrong part of your brain take over. Now, you, of course, you do have to have quick, heuristic, dirty thinking for when when the shit actually hits the fan, and you've got to react. Um, but as a, as a 
uh, dealing with the what I call the pre-fight ritual, or what the what the fellow who wrote the the professor in the cage calls the monkey dance, you know, where 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 you're going through all of the the, the strutting and the boasting and the yelling and everything else that goes on, mm-hmm. which is which strangely that's that's actually a survival mechanism. You know, if you go back far enough, when we were living in nature, red and tooth and claw. It w- it wasn't a survival trait to fight every time someone in your in your group of primates right. wanted to get in your face because then you couldn't go out and hunt food. So right. that's actually a survival mechanism, but it's no longer a survival mechanism. But we it it's still in our DNA and it kicks in. Well, you see animals doing that all the time. There's a whole lot of posturing going on between a couple of dogs before they fight, if they ever do fight, and it's, ruffling uh, up the fur, making themselves look bigger. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So if you understand that, and if you're not too freaked out by it. I mean, the, then there's also the concept of, uh, have you ever heard of this? It's the concept of woofing. Like if you and I are in a confrontation, let's say, for the sake of argument, that you are twice as big as I am and half my age and just muscle upon muscle. Oh, this sounds great. I like this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a, you know, you've, you've, what is it? The testosterone replacement therapy is going extremely well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> and, uh, and you and I get in a confrontation. If you push me hard enough, then I have to attack because otherwise I'm going to lose face, right? I'm going to lose that any status that I have. It's better for me to attack you and get pounded than it is for me to attack you or than it is for me to back down. Absolutely. So, so if you know this, you, you can give me sort of a graceful exit where I, where I back off the little guy going, well, you know, screw you, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to kick your ass uh, tomorrow. I, I just got a, I got an appointment. I, I'll kick your ass tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and if you don't call me on that, yeah, okay, maybe we'll, maybe we'll do this tomorrow. Then it allows me to, to back off with some retention of face. And this whole, that, this whole obsession with face and with status is again a, a caveman reflex, right? I mean, it, right. We were, we're not social animals. Many people in the caveman group who actually got to breed. Right? It's probably, maybe it was like a chimpanzee group where you had an alpha male impregnating all the females and a couple of very frustrated beta males hanging around waiting for the alpha male to either die or get old. I, I think even, even for males and females, not just for breeding, but where you, like for primates, where you are in the social hierarchy is huge. Mm-hmm. And I think that, like one of the, I'm writing a Marshall Brain right now that I haven't recorded yet, where I talk about, uh, like scientists are now starting, social scientists are now starting to wonder if things like gossip and bullying might direct, be directly tied into the fact that we're social creatures and that, and also being hard-headed during an argument, being resistant to changing your mind when faced with facts, that these all stem from it's better to win an argument whether you're right or wrong than to change your mind faced with facts because when you win an argument, your, your status within the group is, is reinforced or even raised. Uh, mm-hmm. So you know you can you can use an ad hominem attack and shout a guy down, but within the group that makes you appear more powerful. So we kind of have this tendency to, to to deviate from being convinced by logic and wanting to just win by you know convincing everybody else almost like any means necessary. Jerry Springer show get, just to get the audience to cheer for you, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and then of course gossiping is a way of reinforcing social status, talking about other people, and the, hence the, the 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 lure of like reality television. And then bullying, of course, is another way of, of like reinforcing that this is where you are in the in the hierarchy, and this is where I am. And all of those, I think, it, an excellent hypothesis. Uh, you know, I don't know how much data is behind it, but it seems logical to me that that reinforces all of that stuff. It's it, it's amazing, and how much of all of this martial arts is concerned with. And then there's a huge resultant dump of brain chemicals as soon as we have one of these status-based interactions. Yes. Where if if we're arguing about uh, I, what's better, uh, iPhone or Android, and you turn it into insulting me personally and yell me <laughs> down and, and <laughs> insult me and win the argument, and you know you get the Jerry Springer audience to cheer for you, the the, the cheap seats turn against me, <laughs> my testosterone plummets and yours rises. Right. And there and there are also a whole bunch of other neurotransmitters that respond to changes in status. And, you know, this happens sort of in a, in a, maybe that's why the traditional martial arts 
we're so resistant to sparring. Maybe that's the real reason, because it allows it threatens status. If I'm the if I'm the best person at doing the Tiger Crane form in the school, because I've been doing it the longest, then my status is fairly secure. Right. But if you and I spar and you take out my tiger claw with a right cross to the face, then the status becomes much more volatile and we can go up and down in rank and up and down in relative position. I mean, certainly I deal with this every time I come back from an injury, right? Like if there have been times when I've been injured and it's taken a long, long time to recover. So now after, you know, a year of barely training, you have to climb back. back up the hierarchy ladder, huh? <laughs> oh, good lord, good lord! And you're getting tapped out by, you know, I'm a black belt, and you're getting tapped out by purple belts, who I'm 50 pounds heavier than. <laughs> and it's, you know, that's that's a hard. Oh yeah, that's a hard thing to. That's a heavy cross to bear. Uh, and that's uh, I forget who was it who was saying that jujitsu is made for you to quit. Like it's one of those moments where you're like, okay, I'm going to take this key and I'm going to burn it. And then you're, you know, then you calm down, and you say, "What did I expect to happen coming back? This is the very essence of the sport. This is why, you know, the, this instant feedback is why I love it. And I just I, got some instant feedback that my timing, my conditioning, my technique is right. It's no almost like a microcosm of the sport versus combat. You've lost the sport element. You've lost the timing and the conditioning." So you're left with the combat phase of it, which is functional in a lot of situations. But you get in there with those young guys that know all your moves and know your timing, and your timing is not sharp. It's it's perfectly logical and reasonable that they would do that. But that doesn't that doesn't assuage the the little the little monkey inside of all of us that wants our status. Mm-hmm. Now, what do you since we're talking about neurochemicals and and chimpanzees or cavemen? What do you suggest? To your students about dealing with the whole fight or flight reflex, the whole gigantic adrenaline dump that happens sometimes appropriately, but realistically in most modern situations, it's not appropriate, right? You, you know, you become a complete idiot and unable to tie your shoelaces, all your fine motor skills go into the trash. How do you suggest to your students to, or what can they do to keep their fight or flight reflex under, under control? Well, one thing, it, it, a, lot, a lot depends on the biggest variable that you haven't stated for me, and that is how much time are we talking about? You know, is the guy mm-hmm. actually attacking you right this second, or is it, is it the pre-fight ritual, the monkey dance going on? Or if, if there's time, if it's just like the pre-fight ritual, then to me what I try to tell them to concentrate on is your breathing. I mean, and not because it has anything to do with chi power, but because that's one of the ways that you can mitigate you know, like people with, with panic disorder, that's one thing that they learn to do is, is learn to focus on their breathing to give them something to concentrate on so that they, don't, they don't think they're going to die right this second. And panic mm-hmm. disorder is nothing but a, an, an unsolicited adrenaline dump, you know, it's, uh, you know it's a fight or flight response that, that you didn't really want to have. And so I think anything that, that helps with something like that, breathing helps a ton. Of course, indoctrinating them. Uh, in like, look, you're going to have little tapes that are going to play across your brain. Like, I can't let this guy get away with this. You know, and it sort of teach them about the things that are going to shoot across their brain. That they've, they've got to learn to get, be really careful not to pay attention to, and to keep themselves focused on what's going on at the moment at hand. But that's that to me is is maybe the the toughest nut to crack in martial arts training and training people. I mean, you really don't know with any of them how it's going to work until you see them. It's a little bit like. Um, tr- training students to fight. I've been training kickboxers for a lot longer than I've been training MMA guys. I've had, I, I coached kickboxers clear back into the early 80s. And, man, a guy, you know how, you know this classic cliche, the guy who is awesome in the gym. And the then gym fighter. And then out there in competition, and boom. And, and, and you never, it's really hard to predict who that's going to be. Mm-hmm. Um, to me, that's kind of a similar phenomenon. You're, you know, you can... You can teach them techniques till you're blue in the face, but you're not sure how they're going to handle a stressful situation. So I, I agree that discussing that is really important, and different students have different problems in that regard. Um, like in a, in a related thing, I've got students who, um, you, you, and I'm sure you've seen this in your teaching, you'll have students who, when they step out to, say, kickbox or, or to c- compete in grappling, they go too hard and they, they – uh, they burn themselves out, you know, they, 
they, they, they get too tired too early because they're thinking of it almost like a fight. Mm-hmm. Um, that guy, you've got to, you've got to think – what I tell people is, look, I want you to go out there and work, not fight. And because you can work longer than you can fight because fighting is a 100-yard dash. Working is running mm-hmm. a marathon. And then other guys, it's like, dude, you've got to fight a little bit more. <laughs> You're out there barely working. And so it's, it's such an individual thing, I think. Mm-hmm. Some, folks, some folks just have the, a little bit of the – are you familiar with the, um, the sociopath te- or the psychopath test book and, the, and the, the fellow who's got this thing going, the psychopath test? Is that the guy who wrote Snakes in Suits? I don't know if he wrote that or not. I, I, I'm not sure about that. But he's got the, he, he, there's apparently a, a, well, uh, a, a well-tested set of, of questions that you can, you can sort of give someone and find out if they're on the psychopath spectrum. And apparently a lot of people that are in very high-stress jobs, like CEOs of corp, major corporations or guys in sp- special forces in the military, um, people in, in positions of leadership like uh, uh, religious leaders and martial arts instructors, there's a high percentage of people that are on that spectrum of, of psychopathy in there because they're fairly cold-blooded. They, 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 don't, they don't lose it as easily in stressful situations. And, of course, I'm not saying they're all raging psychopaths, but there's this spectrum of people like that. that it's, it's a survival mechanism, but people who have terrible psychopathy have got too much of this gene and are, and are non-functional humans anymore. Well, it, the, that... If, if we're thinking about the same guy, he was arguing essentially that we've got this vision of a psychopath being a brain-eating Hannibal Lecter. Right. But it doesn't really mean that. It just means, essentially, if I remember it correctly, an inability to empathize right. no with other people. Yeah. And sort of really only caring about yourself, and other people are just these playthings or tools for you to use. And if, if, that's, if that's the true definition of a psychopath, then I would argue that a lot of CEOs or, you know, snipers or <laughs> and well, certainly psychopathic brain-eating martial arts instructors. Uh, <laughs> I think of lots of examples of that. Yeah, but, sure, sure. I can think of one in particular who's, who's uh, got, a, got a reputation for sex crimes. Yeah. It, uh, well. Yeah, I know. <laughs> not, not the shining... Uh, a shining paragon uh, or exemplar of the martial arts. But really, I mean, there are a lot of people out there teaching martial arts, and I'm sure you would agree, who shouldn't be allowed. I mean, if I was king of the world... Shouldn't be allowed near children, period. Shouldn't be allowed near children, especially. That that was going to be my punchline. Shouldn't be allowed anywhere near... Shouldn't be put in positions of authority, and especially not um, being allowed... Even if they don't eat the brains of or molest the children, they're still horrendous role models. Right. And I, well, I, isn't there an eerie parallel with, with like, you know, uh, Catholic priests, people in religious institutions? It's a position of power and prestige, and I think that a certain type of person tends to be drawn towards that. Um, and, and the thing is, it's, it's always going to be a subset. It's not going to be everyone. I'm, I don't think I'm a psychopath, and I run a martial arts academy. Um, mm-hmm. But it's, it's really important, I think, to to make sure that folks out there realize that that uh, this is this is a this is a real phenomenon in psychology, and it's it there there's data to show that people like this are drawn to positions of power and authority and prestige. I've told this story before uh, on my blog, among other places, but I remember traveling by bus. So I was going through from one side of the uh, continent to the other, and I stopped in a large city, and I had an hour layover. This is when I was pretty young. I was in my early twenties, late teens. And, you know, I had a, an hour or two before the bus went on. So I got out, went for a walk, and I saw, you know, kickboxing right in the downtown core. So I go into the school. I go down the stairs. And I'm going down the stairs. I'm seeing all these signs, you know, the man who masters himself will defeat 10,000 enemies and, uh, you know, discipline, respect, uh, courage. These are, this is what our school stands for and all these other, you know, platitudes, well-meaning tropes that you, you hear And I go down, and I go into the thing, and behind the counter is the school owner who's losing his mind. And he's like, you fucking asshole, those T-shirts, I was counting on them being here today, and they're going to be here tomorrow. That's complete bullshit. You are an asshole. And just losing his mind in amidst all these signs 
talking about, you know, bring your children here. We'll teach them honor, courage, respect, self-control. <laughs> it's like, oh, my God. Wow, it's, yeah. Uh, what a contrast. Uh, yeah. It, uh, and really, martial arts culture at a school. Right. Yeah, it's a little bit the luck of the draw, but so much of it comes from the top down. Absolutely. So much. When, when one of my students is going to move to another city, he always says, you know, well, which style should I train in? Or where, you know, and I say, look, of course, you're going to have a certain preference for certain approaches, but the bottom line is the guy that runs the place. You've got to mm-hmm. feel him out and see what you think. And you still might be fooled, but at least that's where you start. You know, look at that guy. Look at how his uh, advanced students act towards the other students. Does mm-hmm. it look like, a, does it look like you know, they're all trying to make sure they stay, have their place in the pecking order? Are they helping each other? Yeah, I'm in a similar vein, I had a guy years ago, this is like about 1998, taught a, a seminar at my academy, a Sambo seminar. And it was, he was quite competent as a Sambo instructor. And um, I, it, I just didn't work out. He wanted me to get, join his organization. It didn't work out. Years later, I come to find out, he was also uh, in health care, that he raped three of his patients and was in prison for it. So wow, yeah, it's just, you know it's and, and of course we're just giving anecdotal stories here, but um, uh, if I if I wanted to give a lot of data points I could and I'm sure if you wanted to give a lot of data points you could and we would lose all the listeners because it would just go on and on. Mm-hmm. People really need to be careful about this sort of thing. Yeah, I, I think I mean hero worship is kind of a natural progression. I think it's something we're probably wired for. Yes, and it's again because of status. That, yes. And suppression of questions is another sort of indicator of a cult. I, I remember, um, you know, one of my early martial arts instructors, one of my, the, my first exposure to JKD, Jeet Kune Do, was uh, instructor Makoto Kabayama. And in on like class one or class two, he said something like, look, you can ask me any question you want. If I know the answer, I'll tell you. If I don't know the answer, we'll figure it out together. And again, That's this awesome. is one of those mind expanding moments because I he would know everything. Kung Fu <laughs> Sorry. I said, he doesn't know everything. <laughs> no, but at the Kung Fu school that I had been training at, I was known as the guy who asked lots of questions and that I would ration them out. It's like my question for December is going to be this. <laughs> and I would trek Did up. You realize you're irritating your instructor. So you rationed them. Oh, I, I'm sure I was. I'm sure I was. Um, in the end, I sort of ended up getting, <laughs> I remember this, this, pissed me off. I'd been training so hard for four years and I went off to university and this, this Kung Fu school had an application process where you would apply and then they would supposedly do a background check. I don't believe that they actually would. And then they'd call you like a week or two later and let you know you'd been accepted. And I, I think fundamentally it was a way of, again, reinforcing status. Their status is higher than yours because they can keep you out of the school. Right. So I go away to university. I start training Kaju Kembo with Phil Jelena, who is also under Daniel Santo. Yeah, I, I've met him. Oh, good. Um, but at the same time, I'm thinking, you know, I'm going to be going back home for the summer, so I'd like to train at that Kung Fu school again. I hadn't yet completely abandoned it. So I'm doing all my forms diligently and my reverse punches and all this. And I go back, and I walk in the door. I got my gear and one of the head instructors is, oh, hey, you're back. I'm like, yeah. Um, is there a class tonight? He goes, yeah, but you've got to fill out the application form. I'm like, what? Really? No, no, you've got to apply. You've gone away. I've gone away for nine months to study, and now I'm back. And just that, I think, fundamentally disrespectful thing. I think that, more than anything else, was the breaking point with me in the traditional martial arts. I did fill out that form. I did go back and train. But somehow that that was the uh, beginning of the jumping end, of the right? shark moment. The beginning yeah. of the end. It's like uh, real, and then the whole not asking questions and and uh, yeah, that's the, that's the subject of uh, of one of my martial brains. Number thirty. The title is "How Dare You Question My Omniscience." Yes, I, that's my joke <laughs> title for it. And and I talk in it about how it's really moronic to not want students to question, to ask questions in an environment where you're trying to teach them. It doesn't make any sense. But I think a lot of it, maybe not all of it, but I think a lot of it stems from fear of not having an answer right at hand, and that would diminish Mm -hmm. your status. 
Yeah. And maybe it comes from some kind of screwed up Asian. Here, now we're going to, having eliminated the first half of the podcast audience, we're now going to eliminate the second half. <laughs> You're going to eliminate all the Asians. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, maybe it comes from some kind of screwed up Asian hierarchical culture. Group thing culture, yeah. If you are low on the totem pole, uh, yours is but to do and die. Right. Yours is not to question why. I think I got that backwards from Tennyson, but whatever. Right. Um, right. It's still true. Uh, yeah, the, and, uh, the nail that sticks up must be pounded down. Exactly. And that doesn't go real well with Western culture, but maybe for Asianophiles or Nipponophiles or uh, Sinophiles, that was exactly what they were looking for. Oh, questions are not allowed. This must be real. This must be the real stuff. Yeah. Hmm. You know, that, t- that ties in, interestingly enough, with uh, another one of my podcasts. The title is Drop and Give Me 50. And then I pause and I say, dollars, uh, hmm. please give me $50. And it's, it's on what I perceive to be the paradox of in a, a commercial martial arts academy in a, in a capitalist democracy, but yet, so the customer's always right, right? But you're an authority figure <laughs> as a martial arts instructor. You know, and where do you draw that line? Uh, and I joke, of course, about the old cliche story about, like with Musashi, the old master that lives in a hut in the woods, and you go and ask him to train you, and he runs you off and tells you never to come back, and you show your persistence by keep showing up at his door, and finally he agrees to allow you to do chores for him, you know, or just like Daniel in, in uh, the Karate mm-hmm. Kid. And, you know, that whole trope. And then I, and then I say, well, wouldn't it be interesting if you went to a, a mall taekwondo school and the master met you at the door with a shina in his hand and started smacking you about the head and shoulders and then told you to clean his bathroom. Uh, it's just, it's, it's just, it's odd to me how, how we take, how we marry this um, capitalist, you know, customers always right thing with the authority figure. And it's, and what's interesting is some students buy into it differently than others. Like there are people who really want to be screamed at and really mm-hmm. want to be kept in their place. I'm not sure why they really like it. They feel like, like you said, but, and then there are other folks that just have no tolerance for that whatsoever. I think there's a subset of that where some students need, you know, like need that for motivation. And I think really good instructors can tell. I mean, that's, that's definitely not my style to yell and scream at people. And if, if there was um, somebody who that's how they best learn, they best learn from somebody else other right. than me. Right. But, uh, you know, students are – as you pointed out earlier, quite individual in what they need. Some of them need to get fired up. Some of them need to be calmed down. Some of them just need to be given the pieces of information and figure it out on their own. I mean, turn loose. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think trying to, you know, that's a, one of the signs of a really good teacher is somebody who can figure out that, okay, Jeff learns this way. Stefan learns that way. Therefore let's, you know, let Stefan learn the way that he prefers to learn and let Jeff learn the way that he prefers to learn. And not everybody, uh, not everybody learns the same way. I, and I think that also stems from the discussion we had before we started recording, which is a great instructor is someone who gives a shit if you become better and not necessarily puts himself first, but puts the student first. And he's going he's gonna to make the effort to learn the, the peculiarities of each student. And mm-hmm. there are lots of them that, as, as I'm sure you're well aware, that, that don't. I mean, they just like, you know, you learn it my way or the highway. Which, which, or I, just go the old Eastern Bloc method where you start out with 100 students and you uh, <laughs> tear the ACLs of 90 of them and uh, the remaining 10 are the, you do this little Darwinian selection process. You determine who's got the sturdy ACLs. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, I suppose... It's what motivates the instructor. If winning tournaments, and you see this more with Brazilian Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu instructors, but you also see it with with North American. Some of them are totally 100% focused on uh, how their students do in competition, and that I think can sometimes lead to completely ignoring. Arguably, the people who need the martial arts training the most. Absolutely. The housewife. Absolutely. Yeah, the guy who's on the same page with that. left feet. But on the other hand, it does create a certain badass 
environment within the gym where people are going to get good training. So it, I don't know. Maybe there's a maybe there's a way to teach both. You can have your competition hardcore guys and let them go off and do you know 60 minute rounds of Shark Tank, and then you can have your um, not quite competition level guys who that's, are that's probably never going to do in my academy. Absolutely. Really? Oh yeah, I'm, I've got, got a two track program. Well, I don't know if I would go so far as to describe it as two track as much as um, I, I I try to have a place for the crazy intense guys to go. I've got uh, under people instructors under me who can take them aside and work them like crazy guys that are younger and fitter than me, and um, and you know other instructors who who work better with the kids and work better with like the blue collar folks that don't want to don't want to go back to work the next day with a black eye. Um, you know it's is really try, trying to make sure that the facilities are there for all of those different people. I've got, you know, MMA fighters that, that, I, that I coach at my academy and, and kickboxers and boxers, and we have a fencing program. I've got a guy who teaches a fencing program. So we have lots of people who compete, but I absolutely do not push it. I mean, that's completely up to the individual as far as I'm concerned. Mm-hmm. Speaking of MMA, it turns out that we have a mutual connection in the form of Eric Paulson as well. So how long have you been training with Eric? Okay, uh, I first met him when I, in 1996 when I went to an instructor's conference at the Inosano Academy in Los Angeles. And uh, I, took my, I took a Filipino martial arts class from him, strangely enough. Um, he was teaching the FMA class that day, substituting for someone else. And that's when I first met him. It turned out we, we knew a few people, and we talked about that a little bit. But over time, um, he, started, he started teaching seminars in a town that's a, about two and a half hours from here. And um, I started seeing him pretty regularly around this area and he no longer comes around this area so I haven't trained with him in a few years hmm. and I really I miss training with him because he, he doesn't really come within anywhere closer than I don't know uh, four or five hundred miles now hmm. he's avoiding you clearly <laughs> <laughs> I, I love training with sensei Eric he's just it's it's very much like uh, Dan and Osano I mean it's just so much information coming at you and I don't have to tell you this you know it mm-hmm. and he and, you know, you show him something that he hasn't seen before, and he'll come back the next day, and he's got eight counters to it and three variations. Mm-hmm. Really a genius when it comes to grappling. Well, I give him a lot of credit for my my martial arts stuff, but I also give him credit to some extent for grapple arts because back in, God, when was it? Maybe I'll go 2001. A friend of mine, well, I got my hands on a, uh, on a VHS camera, a VHS video camera, and I just thought this was so cool. I can film stuff now. And so i had been playing with... One of those great big steam-powered cameras that you had to hold on your shoulder? Where you take where your cassette (laughs) literally is the size of a VHS cassette. Um, (laughs) So for the young folk folk out there, it's about the size of 18,000 SD cards. Uh, And I went over to the rec room of a friend's uh, apartment, and we filmed a little thing that I'd been thinking about with regards to omoplata. You know, here's some uh, some principles behind it. Here's some applications of it. And I, I was so excited, I made a bunch of copies, and I mailed them off to friends of mine who were out of town. And I trained with Eric, so I mailed them the VHS tape. And next time I saw him, he said, oh, that was pretty good. Uh, you should um, make a commercial version of that and sell it. And I was like, are you kidding? Like, he's like, no, no, no. You're, uh, I think I was only a purple belt at the time. He's like, you're a competitive purple belt. You're an instructor under me. And you can teach well, so, you know, go ahead. And I, without that kick in the butt, I don't think I would have done it. I, I would have been – but somebody <laughs> had to, you know, empower me to do it, and that was Eric. That's cool. And, well, that's yeah, one more debt I, that I owe him because I really like your products. And I bought one of those original copies, that you, commercial copies that you first sent out. He he suggested to me that I do it, and I, I, I really I really liked it. I, you know – the, the, the way you, in its day, you, it was a good product. I think it's. I think that was that. For its day, it was case. definitely a good product. First of all, there wasn't anything about the Omoplata out there at that time. I mean, that was new information. I was just mad at that time about you know, uh, people teaching stuff that they had no personal knowledge of. It, it, the classic example of the day: there was a UFC fighter called Don Fry, sure, great top fighter. Great ground and pound guy, zero bottom game. Right. And he put out his, you know, I don't know, 12 
VHS tape, you know, like secret know. fighting techniques of Don Fry. And one of them was like submissions from the bottom. <laughs> and he'd never submitted anybody from the bottom. He tried to do an arm bar on the wrong arm in the, you know, the fight before. He's padding the series, making, adding extra volumes to the series to make it sound better. <laughs> it, uh, and it's fine. I, I don't fault him. You know, he was good at what he did. But he should not have been making a submissions from the bottom uh, VHS instructional because he had no experience in it. So similarly, I wasn't about to teach, uh, you know, a high crotch takedown series because that wasn't my move. But I did feel that I had the, I mean, when I first, I thought I discovered the omoplata, quite honestly, because it looked a lot like some Indonesian silat. Right. Techniques that uh, I'd learned from Dan Inosanto. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, I, that's the first place I ever learned it was from Dan Inosanto in a, in a, in a, a, a Majapahit or a, a Mathalindo Silat sequence. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. I was like, when I, you know, rolling around with friends, I was like, hey, I got into that weird Silat thing. I discovered <laughs> a brand new technique. I mean, sadly, I found out a little while later that you know, the Brazilians had been doing it for 10 years and it was a high-level attack that was used all the time in, at, a, at the advanced levels at the time. But I discovered it for myself, or rather I imported it into jiu-jitsu for myself. Sure. And, um, yeah, I, I had with a, the thrill of discovery, which is probably most techniques that are invented, you've invented it for yourself because odds are somebody else out there has, you know, right. wrapped it's, the, it's the old cliche around enough. the leg three times. <laughs> Then, it's the old cliche in anthropology about, you know, like the wheel and fire is like, did one person develop it, you know, and it diffused out from him and radiated out, or was it developed independently in different areas? And the martial arts is rife with examples of that. I've, I've come up with stuff and go, man, I've never seen anybody do this. And five <laughs> years later, somebody will teach it to me. Yeah, but yeah I've seen well, it many times. Yeah. It's a, well, it, it's, it's also a phenomenon of the Internet era where – you can't do something cool without it being on Twitter within 10 minutes. <laughs> so, or something uh, humiliating. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's also true. Uh, at which point it will be put in an infinite loop and be <laughs> passed around as an Instagram video. But, uh, to feed people schadenfreude. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, good thing that we're above that. I've, I've, I've heard of these videos of which you speak, but I, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I've never personally looked at them. So, yeah. Uh, Hopefully you're above that as well. I hope I am too. Yeah. Okay, Jeff. Well, this was a fun chat. Um, good luck with your uh, your teaching and your podcasting, so people can find you at the Rising Phoenix Martial Arts Club, Martial Arts Academy. Right. My uh, my website for the academy is rp is in Peter rp martial arts dot com, and my podcast is the Martial Brain, and it's available on Stitcher and on iTunes. Awesome. And all I ask is folks listen to it and give it an honest rating, and, a, and if they want to give it a review, that's great, but it will get pushed further and further if, if folks give it a rating and a review. So it, you know, if they like it, I, mm-hmm. I ask them to do that. And if they don't like it, that's cool. Well, I'm biased, of course, because I think we share, you know, we have ideas in common, so therefore you're a genius. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, uh, I, understand that, I understand the sentiment perfectly. We also have similar hairstyles. Yeah, oh, well, then uh, – a double bonus, but um, it's a it's a voice of sanity in a in an area that sometimes needs a, a good dose of sanity. I agree. All right, Jeff. Best of luck and run into you soon on the match. I hope. I, it sounds great. Uh, it was really a pleasure talking with you, Steph, and thank you so much. Podcast listeners, if you found this interesting or useful or entertaining, please pass this episode on to somebody else in your social circle or in your training circle. Surely there's somebody else out there who would also find it interesting. This is the way the podcast grows. It's an organic growth by people like you pass it on to their friends and the people that they know. I really, really appreciate this kind of sharing. So thank you so much in advance and good luck with your training. Wow, 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 wow,